Minecraft, to me, is one of the greatest games that I've ever played, and that's saying something because I really suck at it. It's a game that succeeds in simplicity. You spawn in a vast and endless world with almost no instructions, and yet your task seems somewhat obvious. You begin to explore. You learn that you can break blocks. You unlock recipes, and slowly you learn to build your own world. You can take on enemies, create a house, make a whole new game mode. There's an infinite amount of things that you can do in this game, and it really allows the player to be creative and play the way they want to. It allows for so much freedom and movement, and that's why I think it resonates with so many people and connects people from across the world. But with that being said, the logic and science in this game sucks. Like, what is this logic? Can someone please explain? These stats are staggering. Had his PhD in indiscreet street haggling. Now, Minecraft doesn't need to be realistic. Games that stick too close to realism can be boring and complicated and limiting to creativity, which is the opposite of what Minecraft is. But with that being said, the science behind this game was something I wanted to research for a very long time. If I were to explain the game to a Minecraft layman, I would say there are three parts. Exploring, crafting, and mining. And today I'm going to talk about all three. These stats are staggering. Minecraft stretches on for what feels like infinity as the game generates new, unique terrain. And as you explore it, you're bound to walk, jump, and definitely fall. But what is falling? And more specifically, how does gravity affect the game? I started by asking the question, what is the value of the acceleration due to gravity in Minecraft? To test this, I made an experiment. I created a delayed redstone signal activated by a pressure plate, which deactivates extended pistons and forces them to retract. If you don't understand anything I'm saying, basically I just created a control environment to analyze the data. With this information, I was able to calculate the acceleration due to gravity acting on the player using this formula. I'm using this formula to look for A, or acceleration, because I have displacement, initial velocity, and time. The value of displacement in this case would be height, which is 50 blocks. According to the Minecraft wiki and confirmed by the creator, every block in Minecraft is 1 meter tall and 1 cubic meter in volume. Therefore, the displacement in this case is 50 meters. The initial velocity is 0 meters per second because the player isn't moving. Using my editing software, I was able to find time by going frame by frame and seeing exactly when the player hits the ground. That time was exactly 2 seconds. Using this calculation, I found that the acceleration due to gravity acting on the player is 25 meters per second squared. That's insanely high. For reference, the gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. That means that the gravity in Minecraft is the same as the gravity on Jupiter. Let's just ignore the fact that Jupiter has 15 times the surface area of the Minecraft world, but still has the same gravitational pull. Let's also ignore the fact that a lot of people believe that the Minecraft world is flat other than a couple skeptics, which sounds weird to say out loud. I mean, I'm sure no one believes that the Earth is flat. Anyways, I know that Quora isn't the most reputable source, but as a long-time Minecrafter, I could say on behalf of the community that most people either assume that the world is flat or a cube, unless you're the type of person to make rant videos saying that it's round. Well, at least we found an acceleration of gravity that affects all items in Minecraft equally. Right? And then came my next question. Does this gravitational pull affect all items equally? I did the same experiment, but with different items, including hostile and passive mobs, like the zombie, sheep, and pig, sand, gravel, and anvil, and lastly, arguably the most rare item in the game, the Dragonite. I've been playing Minecraft for a long time, and I really expected that all of these items would drop at the exact same time, and I was shocked when they didn't. Instead, the zombie, sheep, and the pig drop at the same time, followed by sand, gravel, and the anvil, and lastly, the dragon egg. This changed the way I approached the question. I calculated the acceleration of these objects using the same process that I used to calculate the players. Here are their accelerations in meters per second squared. The player has 25, mobs 23, sand, gravel, and the anvil have 12, and the dragon egg 11. If gravity was constant for all of these items, they would have dropped at the exact same time. This begs the question, why are the gravities of these items different? My first instinct was to say that perhaps air resistance was to blame. My calculations didn't take that into consideration, but I started thinking more deeply about it. The anvil has a smaller surface area than the sand and the gravel, and yet they fall at the same time. And how is it possible that the dragon egg falls slower than the other items? I mean, it has the most aerodynamic shape of all of them. Can someone please explain to me why this falls at the same speed as this. I mean, we know the Minecraft world is air. It's filled with living creatures and we even see cloud movement. What is this physics, Mojang? <sighs> this really made me wonder why Mojang would go through extra effort to code different gravities for these different items. I mean, most casual players probably won't even notice it unless they make their final science project on analyzing gravity. Now, gravity doesn't affect all blocks in the game. In fact, the majority of them stay suspended in the air. You wanna know what? No, I am gonna leave. <laughs> It's really important that gravity only affects certain blocks in the game, otherwise other parts of the game would be compromised. Caves would collapse, roofs would be near impossible to build, and there would be a ton of accidental you died screens. In fact, some people have even tried to recode the game and modify gravity to affect all blocks. A YouTuber named Dream uploaded a very popular video of his experience to YouTube. <gasps> look out, look out, look out, look out! Oh my god! No! What?
I mean, it's obvious why gravity doesn't affect all blocks now, right? And that addition of gravity doesn't make the game look any more realistic. So trying to apply gravity to the game yields poor results. But what if we tried to apply Minecraft gravity to real life? And no, I'm not talking about floating structures and gravityless blocks. I'm curious, how would our world be fundamentally changed if different objects had different gravities in the real world? First, let's call back that the Minecraft gravity acting on the player is the same as the gravity on Jupiter. The Jupiter that has a mass 318 times larger than Earth's. The Jupiter, whose gravitational pull would crush humans under immense pressure like it did the Galileo probe. My only conclusion is that Steve may be the strongest living being alive. But again, if different objects dropped at different rates, our world would be changed so much. The way that we did kinematics, energy, and force equations would change. Aircrafts, spaceships, cars, and any other type of major transportation would have to be altered to adjust for these different gravities. Of course, this would never happen in reality, but it's an interesting thought experiment. Well, at least we know that although these different items have different gravities, they stay constant. Unless... Okay, there's actually another way that items can experience gravity, and that way is TNT cannons. Explosives can actually be used to launch gravity-affected items through the air in a perfect parabola, which again brings Minecraft's air resistance into question. I conducted another experiment. First, I found exactly where the block landed, 74 blocks away. At the vertex, the block is 30 meters high. We know that the block takes the same amount of time to rise and fall because it's a perfect parabola. So we can use the halved values to find its falling acceleration. Half of 74 is 37 meters. And the total time that the block took was 4.2 seconds, which halved is 2.1 seconds. With an initial velocity of zero, we can plug those values in to find that the gravity affecting this piece of sand is 13.6 meters per second squared. Looking at our original calculation of the gravity affecting sand, we can see that they are different values. What? Not only does Mojang have different values for different blocks, but depending on the way they are launched, they have different gravities affecting them. What? I swear I'm gonna get a headache. Now there's actually a third way that gravity affects items, and that's when they're thrown by players or launched by dispensers. I didn't include them in this experiment, and the reason behind that is because when you drop them, these entities look much smaller than the original block size. So I always thought that Mojang did this as more of a stylistic choice than a realistic depiction. YouTuber Ben Garner, not the soccer coach, actually did a very similar experiment to mine but include dropped items. Seriously, I did not know that this video existed when I made my experiment, but I'm really glad that someone else had a very similar idea to me. He actually found that these items drop much slower than the original item. As you can see, the player hit the ground first, followed by the anvil and the gravel block at the same time, and then the gravel as an item. And this realization doesn't really change any of my conclusions. Minecraft gravity is still senseless and confusing. But in the end, even though the physics behind the gravity in this game is ridiculous, it doesn't change the experience behind exploration in the game. Okay, so now what about crafting? Staggering. Crafting is essential to the game. I mean, it's literally half of the title. Crafting allows you to take raw materials and transform them into useful objects. There are hundreds of crafting recipes in the game, from fermented spider eye, to stained glass. But does this part of the game hold up? Thanks to Antoine Lavoisier, we know about the law of conservation of mass, the theory that he created saying that mass in a system stays constant because matter cannot be created nor destroyed. He also created this fire hairstyle. Thank you so much, Antoine. I'll take it from here. Hi. I mean, one of the first crafting recipes you learn is the recipe for stairs. Rather than continuously jumping from block to block, stairs allow you to glide up on an incline, which isn't how stairs work in real life, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, I hate my life. But the recipe doesn't really make much sense. You need six blocks of wood to make four stairs. Remember that each block in Minecraft is a cubic meter, so the recipe takes six cubic meters of wood and turns them into four times 0 0.75 three cubic meters of wood, which means they lose half of the wood that they put into the craft. Now, some loss would be acceptable. Cutting anything creates loss, whether that be sawdust or pieces of unusable wood. When ordering floor tiles, you have to order extra to try to account for that loss. But three cubic meters, or 50%, is more than a little bit of loss. But where did this extra three cubic meters of wood go? And I mean, three cubic meters of oak wood is a ton. 4.32 tons to be exact. More evidence proving that Steve is incredibly strong. And I mean, this problem hasn't gone unnoticed. Minecraft YouTuber Exumavoid created a popular website where you can download modifications of the game, including a tweak where you can change the crafting recipe of stairs to be the correct 8 stairs per 6 blocks. Without the mod, that extra 3 cubic meters of wood just vanishes into the air. My main man Antoine must be shaken right now. And that's not the last problem. What about chests, which use 8 cubic meters of wood to create a block that is 0.875 cubic meters and is definitely hollow. 
What about the fact that one cubic meter of wood can be turned into four cubic meters of planks? What about bookshelves, which use six cubic meters to create one? What about note blocks, or stripped wood, or shields, or pressure plates, or trapdoors, or fence gates, or buttons, or jukeboxes, and that's just the wood items? How about packed ice, or blue ice, or furnaces, or dispensers, or pistons, or droppers, or daylight sensors, or TNT, and I'm just naming a few. Now it'd be impossible for Mojang to make all of the crafting recipes 100% accurate. It would make it harder to distinguish between crafting recipes, and make it harder to have a bunch of unique recipes. Recipes. Similarly, if the recipes for rare items use less materials, it would make the process of gathering those items and crafting them much less satisfying for the player. That payoff of that new, rare item is kind of lost. What Mojang could have done was give us some of the excess. What about a new scrap material that you can give players which they can craft back into useful blocks like wood or iron. How about even if there's excess wood in a recipe, you can give that back to players in the form of sticks. But all I know is that the majority of crafts ignore this very simple scientific rule to make life a lot easier. Just imagine that in real life, ignoring all the laws and having life be a little bit easier. I can't believe I just made that joke. I'm a good kid, I swear. But that isn't the only time that Minecraft ignores the law of conservation of mass. For me to delve into more of these scientifically criminal aspects of Minecraft, I'm gonna have to talk about the next part, mining. That's staggering. I'd like to begin with a quote. <clears throat> so we back in the mine, got our pickaxe swinging from side to side. This quote shows the importance of mining to the game. It's a core action that players need to execute in order to progress in the game. Mining allows players to access stone, iron, gold, and an entire alternate dimension. Great! Anyways, apart from all of the fiction, I've genuinely learned a lot from this game. As a young kid, I was inspired to research about Lapis Lazuli, which I knew nothing about. I learned about its religious and artistic significance in ancient societies, and I also learned that recently, it's being used to try to analyze and image biological samples. I learned about basic circuitry by playing around with redstone and comparators and repeaters. The game allowed me to learn and do whatever I wanted, and that developed a little bit of a creative spirit in me. But there's one block I wanted to understand deeper. Minecraft has a lot of fictional blocks in the game, so I wanted to take some of the properties of the blocks and try to apply it to real life. Maybe I can find out what those fictional blocks' counterparts are in the real world. And to do this, the first block I thought of was Soul Sand. Soul Sand gets its name from the fact that the texture contains what looks like faces or souls etched into it. It's found in the nether dimension, surrounded by lava and so much heat that water instantaneously evaporates. Whoa. In earlier versions of the game, players might as well have thought that this block was useless. Other than the fact that soul sand can be used to grow nether wart, which could be used for potions, and also it could summon a boss called the wither. While this all sounds incredibly fantastical, the properties of soul sand are incredibly simple. It slows down player movement and even causes the player to sink 2 pixels or 12.5 centimeters in the real world. From this, we can assume that soul sand is like sand, maybe a brownish powder. But the most unique property is that soul sand can generate bubbles underwater. The force of these bubbles are actually strong enough to push the player up from underneath them whenever they pass over a piece of soul sand underwater. The player rises faster when they pass over soul sand, making it the in-game opposite of magma, which pulls players down like crippling existentialism. This means that soul sand is experiencing some sort of chemical reaction in the water. My first instinct was that soul sand might be an alkaline metal. Alkaline metals are very highly reactive, and they're actually the first row on the periodic table. Since they only have one electron in their outer shell, they're highly unstable and want to react as quick as possible, meaning that underwater they might bubble and sometimes even burn. But soul sand is definitely not an alkaline metal. For starters, I'm sure that in the nether dimension, where water literally cannot exist, alkaline metals won't react. But once brought into the overworld, the alkaline metals will want to start to react with the moisture in the air. That's why these metals are traditionally stored in oil. But apart from that, their reactions in water are too violent to be similar to the soul sand's slow bubbles. Not to mention that none of them even look like soul sand. And lastly, alkaline metals are less dense than water, meaning that they would float to the surface. So this is a dead end. Next, I stumbled upon this list of water reactive chemicals made by the Berkeley lab. Most of this list is occupied by chemicals that create very violent reactions, which doesn't fit soul sense characteristics at all. But this list also had a ton of other chemicals. Phosphoryl chloride and sulfuric acid have slow reactions with water, but they take the form of a clear liquid. The only other two substances with less violent reactions were potassium hydride and calcium hydride. The former taking the form of a colorless crystal and the latter taking the form of a white or brown powder. A brown powder. Sound familiar? Why am I I talking like that? Why did this just turn into an episode of Dora? Which way should we go? Towards potassium hydride or calcium hydride? You choose! <laughs> Thank you for yelling at the TV! When impure, which is far more common than its pure form, calcium hydride takes the form of a brown powder. In fact, these impurities make the reaction for lack of a better word, less intense. The chemical formula for the reaction is this, showing that the addition of calcium hydride to water creates hydrogen gas, 
the bubbles, and calcium hydroxide. The main issue is that calcium hydroxide is a very basic substance with a high pH known as slaked lime. Sometimes when lakes or other bodies of water are extremely acidic, a small amount of a basic substance, often lime, is added to the lakes to try to create a neutralization reaction. A neutralization reaction is when an acidic substance and a basic substance mix to form a water and a salt. Water has a neutral pH level and is safer for underwater life to flourish. The issue is that this isn't just a little bit of calcium hydroxide. The density of calcium calcium hydride is 1.9 grams per centimeters cubed. Since a block in Minecraft is a cubic meter, soil sand has a mass of 1.9 million grams. Using its molar mass of 42.1 grams per mole, I can use this formula to find that soil sand has 45,131 moles of calcium hydride. If you don't understand anything I'm saying, I basically just found out how much soil sand is actually in a soil sand block. And using the same formula for the products, I found that a block of soil sand will produce 3.34 million grams of slaked lime. That is incredibly high. This is an incredibly high amount of a basic substance to be released into an ocean with living creatures. It has a pH of about 12.4, which is toxic for most life underwater. Large amounts of calcium hydroxide is to the sea as I am to the YouTube ecosystem toxic. Not to mention the amount of hydrogen and indirect greenhouse gas to be released into the atmosphere. That's definitely going to be causing some digital climate change. Now, of course, this is just a theoretical yield. The calcium hydride I'm referring to is impure, so some loss is probably going to be expected. However, this is still an insanely high value. But I still haven't mentioned the law of conservation of mass. How is it possible that soil sand infinitely generates these bubbles? For a chemical to continually generate a product, there has to be a constant input of reactants. Otherwise, it will violate the law of conservation of mass, and soil sand isn't having any more input. Imagine a fire burning without any fuel. That's impossible because the chemical formula for that would be imbalanced. That's why the Earth stays almost the same weight, because apart from debris that's coming from space, even though more people are born and more buildings are built, Earth is a closed system, meaning all of the mass stays here. Soil sand completely ignores that rule. If our real life functioned like this, everything would change. Creating matter is like some alchemist stuff, and no, I'm not talking about the Freddie Gibbs collaborative project, and no, I'm not talking about the Paulo Coelho book. The value of materials in real life would change if you could just create more of them with less products, and that's definitely going to affect our economy. If the law of conservation of mass didn't exist, the closed system of the earth would stop being closed. So, now I've analyzed Minecraft. And really, you're probably left with only one question. Why did I sink my time into analyzing a game where the final boss is a dragon from an alternate dimension and everything is a cube? I guess that's the real mystery. The fact that a fictional video game with giant spiders and zombies is unrealistic is not helpful analysis. That might be what you're thinking right now, but that's the point. Video games don't have to be realistic. Developers are always trying to push game making forward by making things more realistic and more advanced. But I argue realism isn't necessary to make a great game. The fact that a game with a world constructed of visible pixels and cubes is the top selling game of all time says something. And that's why I'll always come back to it. I know I've said this already, but I can literally do anything in this game. People have pushed the game to its limit, built jaw-dropping structures, and there's even a project to recreate the Earth on a one-to-one -one scale in Minecraft. And others? They just fish. And neither playstyle is wrong. Realism isn't that important. It's how a game connects with you, and it makes you feel that will stick with you forever. Thank you for watching, and please speak up and stay safe. So trying to... So try... Oh my god. Okay. There's a ton of thunder and lightning outside, and it's raining really bad. It's literally shaking the room. Oh my god, I have like, still have three pages to go through. Ah! PA